Hello, and welcome to Decarbonize, the clean energy podcast from Fresh Energy. Fresh Energy is a Minnesota nonprofit working to speed our state's transition to a clean energy economy. My name is Joe Olson. I do communications here at Fresh Energy, and I'm here today to share with you a recording of our 2021 Earth Day panel discussion called Reckoning in Coal Country, Facing the Future in Wyoming and Appalachia. So we hosted this event with Energy News Network, Wyofile, and the Just Transition Fund. It was uh, hosted digitally, and now we're sharing it with you today on the podcast. Um, so at this event, Energy News Network's Ken Pullman led a panel of experts, thought leaders, and journalists through a really meaningful discussion about the cultural, political, and economic obstacles faced by rural communities hoping to survive and thrive in a world without coal. And with that, I will begin the recording. Thanks for tuning in. Welcome everybody to uh, this webinar uh, panel discussion, we're gonna call it, uh, Reckoning in Coal Country, Facing the Future in Wyoming and Appalachia. My name is Ken Palm and I am the director of the Energy News Network based in St. Paul, Minnesota. And this event is produced by us and Fresh Energy. Uh, the Energy News Network is a program of Fresh Energy a uh, 501c3 nonprofit based in St. Paul, Minnesota. <clears throat> Fresh Energy's mission is to shape and drive bold policy solutions to achieve equitable carbon neutral economies. Together, we are working toward a vision of a just, prosperous, and resilient future powered by a shared commitment to a carbon neutral economy. And I also want to uh, drop in a couple of other acknowledgments if we can pop to the next slide. Um, this uh, event is based on a reporting series that we did last year in partnership with Wildfile. So I want to acknowledge uh, Wildfile, a uh, nonprofit newsroom uh, based in uh, in Wyoming, and uh, Katie Klingsporn, who helped to edit the series for us, as well as the Just Transition Fund, uh, who provided funding uh, for this work. And next slide, I will introduce our panelists here shortly. But first, I want to go over some quick housekeeping. Um, you may submit questions. There is a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen if you would like to submit a question. These will be uh, visible to anybody. You can upvote questions if you, if you like. Um, we will try to introduce them into the conversation as we can. I cannot guarantee we will get to all of the questions or even any of them. It kind of depends on how things go. And also, I want to let everyone know that this event is being recorded. It will be posted in both video and podcast form. And after the event, you will receive an email with links um, to the recording, as well as other uh, information. And so with that, I would like to turn it over to our panelists to give a quick uh, introduction. And we will start with, uh, with Mason. Hi, everyone. I'm Mason Adams. I'm a freelance reporter <clears throat> in Floyd County, Virginia sort of on the eastern edge of Appalachia. Um, I didn't grow up in a coal producing county, but I grew up in a, the railroad ring, sort of around those coal producing counties. And just the disruption and changes within the coal industry have overshadowed pretty much my entire career. It's impossible to write in Western Virginia, the Appalachian part of Virginia about, you know, business, utilities, um, energy, environment, local government and politics um, without without getting into coal at some level. So that's that's sort of the experience I brought to to the series. Uh, Shannon, go ahead next. Hi, everyone. Happy Earth Day. Um, I'm Shannon Anderson from Powder River Basin Resource Council. I'm our staff attorney here. Um, and I moved home to my hometown about 13 and a half years ago to work on coal in Wyoming. Uh, Wyoming, for those that don't know, produce, produces roughly 40% of the nation's coal production, um, largely from federal coal assets owned by you and me as American taxpayers. Um, so I work on uh, coal mining, coal-fired power plants, and um, a whole host of impact issues related to that, um, including most recently laid off workers and our economy and communities here in Wyoming. Um, so this map just basically shows you the Powder River Basin, um, our mines, um, and you can see my hometown is shared in there on the Western edge. Um, so thanks, I look forward to the conversation. Great, thanks Shannon. Uh, Heidi, would you like to go next? Yeah, thanks Ken. Um, happy Earth Day, everybody. Um, 
great that we're having this conversation today. Um, my name is Heidi Binko. I'm the executive director and co-founder of the Just Transition Fund. We are a philanthropic initiative that got started um, just about six years ago, actually, uh, to help uh, coal communities across the United States, so places where coal plants and coal mines have closed or will close, uh, deal with the economic stress and the economic changes that they are facing. And uh, I'm just really thrilled to be part of this, this conversation today. These are issues that are really personal to me. I'm from a small town in Western New York where a, a coal plant closed. And I had family that worked in that plant for 40 years. So these issues are near and dear to my heart and uh, I'm looking forward to the conversation. Great, thanks Heidi. Dustin. Hi, my name is Dustin Bleizeffer. I live in Casper, Wyoming, which is sort of East Central uh, Wyoming. And I've covered the energy industries here in Wyoming for more than 20 years. And uh, my personal connection to coal and coal communities is that I, I grew up in Gillette, Wyoming, which is the epicenter of the Powder River Basin, um, which Shannon mentioned provides about 40% of the nation's coal. Um, my other connection is that my father worked 33 years at one of those Powder River Basin coal mines. Uh, most of that time as a shovel operator under a high wall at, at Black Thunder. And so, yeah, uh, similarly, it, it, it's uh, the coal industry has been so, you know, has had such a large presence in Wyoming. Um, it, there's not a, a, an area of life it doesn't touch. So. Great, thank you. And so uh, before we dive into the conversation, I'll explain a little bit of how we got here today. Um, last year, we uh, worked with uh, Just Transition Fund to develop a, a journalism series around coal transition uh, communities in different states. And so we were looking at uh, Appalachia, and of course, we, we worked with Mason on some other projects before. And then we wanted to do something in Wyoming. So we reached out to Wyofile and they connected us with Dustin. And in the course of those conversations, uh, we hatched the idea like, what if we send Mason to Wyoming, what if we send Dustin to Appalachia and see how this story looks uh, through, through fresh eyes coming into a, a different region that's struggling with the same issues. Uh, we all love the idea and then the pandemic hit. And of course, so that kind of put a hitch in our travel plans. Um, but to uh, Mason and Dustin's credit, they um, both uh, pursued the idea of the best that, that we could do working uh, remotely and connecting with sources and communicating with each other and helping each other out. Um, just a, a tremendous, I wanna give them credit for their, their professionalism and there was absolutely no ego involved and it was uh, remarkable to, to see them work together and produce this project. This resulted in a six part series that's posted on our website at energynews.us. It's also available as a book. Um, in paperback and ebook form, and we will be pitching you on that later, of course. Um, but so I want to kick off the conversation with with Dustin and Mason, whoever wants to jump in first, and I'll start with a question. Uh, what is something you learned reporting these stories that you didn't expect? I can start um, a little bit just because, uh, you know, he, here in Appalachia, it's a very large, heterogeneous region. Um, there are 13 states uh, recognized by the Appalachian Appalachian Regional Commission. The only one that's entirely in there is West Virginia, and nine of them produce coal. And so it looks very different depending on where you go. And um, the, the industry has just sort of been in constant deterioration since the 1920s when we saw the employment peak in the coal industry. So to some degree, um, you know, idling mines and companies going bankrupt has, has almost felt like a, like a dog bites man story. It's kind of what you expect. But one thing I learned is um, just within this region, no matter what happens here and people, you know, have been expecting talking about the region being, my, you know, getting close to being mined out for for 20 plus years. They've, they've more recently started to come around to the idea that no new coal fired power plants are going to be built. But there's always been this existence of Wyoming within the cultural imagination as this place where coal does thrive and the place that's going to be the future of coal. I mean, We've seen that just over the decades. Dustin can attest to this, but there was a steady stream of miners from Appalachia to Wyoming. And so to hear the Wyoming perspective about the steep, rapid drop off in the industry there, I think has, has um, kind of shocked my system a little bit just because I'm used to the, the talk about coal deteriorating and, and it's still continuing to exist. And so 
Um, so to, to hear about the changes in Wyoming, which has been sort of a cultural lodestone here, just was was um, really surprising and eye opening for me. Dustin, I would defer to you. Yeah, uh, yeah, I, I would agree. I, you know, what surprised me was I, I guess I didn't realize uh, just how long Appalachian communities have been uh, dealing with transition, uh, just going back decades and decades, and that different communities are at different stages. Whereas in Wyoming, this is happening to the entire state all at once. And, and you know, that's coming off this belief for a long time. You know, Wyoming residents were told that the coal in the Powder River Basin would, would support us for 200 years. And at any time there was a, a hiccup along the way, that there would be a political solution. Um, you know, but I was also kind of struck, and, and I'm really sorry I didn't get to travel uh, out east, but I'm also really struck by kind of the differences in culture, uh, coal culture. You know, um, the unions have much more of a presence in history in Appalachia, obviously, where there's barely a, a, a union presence among coal miners in, in the Wyoming. And so, I, I think that kind of shifts the conversation a lot of the times uh, it, and just keeps it in the hands of elected officials. You know, there's kind of this notion that the best way to help coal miners is to help the coal corporation. And coal miners in Wyoming are kind of expected to remain silent and grateful. And so far, that's still what's happening. And, and to just build on that, I mean, I. I think that the importance of unions in Appalachia toward coal is largely culturally and politically, because certainly a, there's not that many unionized minds here anymore as well. Um, so that's, but, but you're right. I mean, when the Black Jewel bankruptcy happened, you saw miners in Harlan County, Kentucky block a train till they could get paid in an action that was very reminiscent of some of these old union actions. So it's, it's that cultural heritage is important. Right, and so, um, and we can expand this this question out to anyone who wants to jump in. But one of the, I feel like the the values we came away with from from this reporting is, in a lot of ways, by exploring the differences, it sort of uh, brings into kind of stark relief what are the commonalities and what are the common challenges. And I wonder if anyone, uh, Dustin or Mason or Heidi or Shannon, any of you wants to jump in and and uh, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to jump in, Ken. Thanks for that. You know, um, at the Just Transition Fund, we work natu na nationally. So we do a lot of work throughout all of the Appalachian states. We work in the Illinois Basin, states like Illinois, um, Ohio, Minnesota, Indiana. And then we do work with tribal communities out west, um, do a lot of work in Colorado too, uh, and Wyoming. And I am always struck and have been over the last, you know, eight, 10 years that we've been doing this work, I've been struck by the similarities. You know, I, I think that we can, you know, at the end of the day, communities are gonna need different things, but um, at the, there, there's a set of commonalities that, that really um, unites us, I think. And I think it's on those that we wanna, we wanna focus at least at the, at the Just Transition Fund, because when it comes time to think about federal solutions, it's much more empowering to have community voices from all around the country coming together to advocate for what they need and putting forward a framework than it is to, you know, focus on those more granular differences. So, you know, I love the reporting series and I think it's great to, great to focus on those differences. Um, but I think those, those commonalities, like um, focusing on the common solutions right across a number of different sectors is really what's going to help us accelerate action on this issue. Yeah, if I could just add too, I mean, I think what in working with colleagues in Appalachia, I mean, what really does bring us together is our people and our love of community, a love of place, um, that commitment to that place. And um, there are, you know, groups working across the country, there's people working across the country, government officials, agencies, um, that really do, I think, share that, that love of place and, and realizing that it's more than just a resource. And even if that resource is no longer mined and produced, um, it's really the people that are the resources of that community and can be um, used in an economic transition sort of way. So um, yeah, I find a lot of common ground with colleagues in Appalachia um, doing this kind of work. 
So let's build on that because this is one of the things that I think is a is maybe a big misunderstanding that a lot of people have about this issue is that well we'll just kind of close down the coal mines and everybody will get jobs working on solar panels or learning to code or learning how to climb wind turbines and it's going to be all good but it's really more complicated than that isn't it yeah ken it's much more complicated than that i mean that's a story that we've been hearing for for a lot of years and you know from from our perspective um you know this this work is ultimately about trying to help people feed their families and take care of themselves right so it's about um, showing people and helping them develop a vibrant economic future no matter where they are, right? And so, and, and these communities also have suffered from, you know, one of the commonalities is that, you know, a lot of them have suffered from years of disinvestment, right? So we're starting at a place where there is already a lot of economic distress. And, you know, you mentioned COVID. COVID has just only really made it worse, right? So when we think about what it's going to take to get there and get over the over the finish line, clean energy absolutely plays a critical plate plays a critical role in all of these communities, but it's also going to be investments in the reclamation economy, the knowledge economy, manufacturing, right, and a host of other things. We sort of need it. It's an all hands on deck moment. Yeah, I mean, here in Wyoming, when you have one commodity that has funded so much and, and employed so many people, it's, it's not a one for one replacement, right? I mean, it never can be, but it's, you know, there's pieces of the clean energy economy that will be really important here. I mean, Wyoming has tremendous wind and solar resources, um, both large scale and small scale. And we have, um, again, tremendous people assets that um, have job training and education that work naturally in those fields of clean energy. So um, it's definitely a piece of the puzzle, as Heidi said, but it's, it's not a one-for-one -one replacement. Dustin and Mason, I'd like to hear from both of you too. I mean, Dustin, you're, you, you come from that, that culture, you've worked in the mines. And, and so I'm, I'm interested in your perspective on, on that question as far as from, from a worker standpoint, like, where do you go? Like, what, 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 what do you want to see? Yeah, it's really difficult uh, to, to replace a, uh, a coal mine salary in Gillette, Wyoming. And, you know, Gillette, Wyoming, the, you know, this is a community that you know, got, got labeled with the Gillette syndrome in the 70s uh, from a, there was a national article. And, uh, and, so let's always kind of taken that seriously and they built uh, just a fantastic community out of this mineral wealth. And, you know, it, it's that community uh, that drove this, the success of these coal corporations. Um, and, and the quality of life there in, in a place like Gillette, it, I mean, it's really rare for a rural town in, in the West uh, that doesn't attract a lot of tourists. Um, so it, it's a really high quality of life there. Um, they're, they're technically trained and, you know, there, there's more people working uh, in the services that service those mines um, than, than maybe at the coal mine themselves. Uh, so yeah, th these are communities that they don't want to abandon. <laughs> they don't want to have to start closing schools and parks. Um, so, so there is just this love of place, um, you know, folks, folks here have, you know, enjoyed a high quality of life where they can um, drive in any direction to enjoy vast public lands, you know, from, from the valleys and deserts to the mountaintops. And, and so, you know, I, I, I think there's a lot of um, determination, uh, you know, to find something that, uh, you know, won't can't replace these jobs, uh, but, but hopefully sustain the community. Right, I agreed with all that. And um, talking about commonalities, I mean, Appalachia and Wyoming certainly have a lot in common, but just as I've written about other parts of the country that may be have other, in, in, uh, that are driven by other industries besides coal, whether you're talking about, you know, timber in Maine or the Pacific Northwest or oil and gas down on the Gulf Coast, there, there, are very, there are a lot of cultural connections where the industry's um, cultural footprint outstrips its um, economic footprint. And the other piece that people misunderstand a lot is they, they like to just focus the discussion to, to the coal producers themselves. 
or, or the power companies, but there's a lot of downstream industries. You know, I mentioned the railroad earlier, there's equipment manufacturers. So it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a huge swath of folks that are affected. Um, a lot of places are pretty far down the road um, on, on transition. You know, this was, the, Appalachia was sort of the epicenter for Lyndon Johnson's war on poverty as well. So federal money has been flowing in through, in the form of um, government money, but also grants for, for 50 years. And with varying degrees of success, you know, a lot of com uh, communities are seeing depopulation. They're seeing loss of revenue as coal moves out and jobs go out and people follow them. So it's a very wicked, uh, complicated problem for building futures in these places. And, and a lot of journalism, I, I don't wanna throw stones, but there is a certain type of story that's about coal miners can do this and save Appalachia. And it's never that simple. You know, I talked to Chris Willery with the Mountain Association in Kentucky, and it's a metaphor I find myself using all the time where he says there's no one silver bullet that's going to fix this. It's going to take a lot of silver BBs. And, and that's what you tend to see in successful communities is where you have groups coming together. And, and I mean, groups in different industries, different types of the parts of the economy that actually make the change that's meaningful for people. Yeah, I want to pull a question out from uh, from the audience. So Martin Volker writes, uh, can you address the health care issue where minors with likely long term health issues are losing care along with their jobs in countries with universal health care? That at least is not a worry. I do want to invite folks if you're if you're if you have a question, use the Q&A function and not the chat. Um, and then everyone else can see it. But so, you know, we don't have universal health care. We're not going to have it anytime soon. And I know we uh, covered a bit of uh, health care infrastructure and other broader social infrastructure like schools and community centers and things like that that are really heavily dependent on revenue um, from this industry. And so uh, maybe uh, Mason Dust, I might throw it back to you um, to tell us a little bit about what you've, you found uh, in your reporting. Well, one big difference, and I'll use this to toss to Dustin, but um, Central Appalachia, the, the mining states, the mining communities largely have expanded Medicaid. Virginia and Kentucky did from the get-go. Uh, I'm sorry, West Virginia and Kentucky did from the get-go. Virginia expanded theirs in 2018, just in time to kind of spread the program before the pandemic hit. But Tennessee, um, which has a much smaller mining footprint, noticeably is, you know, notably is not expanded Medicaid, and you're seeing it in a number of hospital closures, and Wyoming hasn't expanded Medicaid yet either, although I'll let Dustin talk about that. No, uh, Wyoming has not expanded Medicaid. Uh, the, the, um, there are attempts every year. Um, it, it got closer than we've ever gotten. One, one house passed a bill, um, and so maybe there's momentum there. Uh, but, you know, one effect of a uh, decline in coal production is a decline in, in those local tax bases. You know, uh, add, as the property assessment goes down for these mines, that generates less money for the local hospital. Um, and, and so they're already seeing, um, before COVID struck, uh, these hospitals are already seeing just kind of their foundational uh, sources of revenue starting to shrink. And, and so that's gonna be a real challenge uh, with an aging uh, coal miner community. Uh, and yeah, just politically, um, you know, for a state that just can't bring itself to Medicaid expansion because um, you know, it, it, it supposedly doesn't like help from the federal government. But we sure do get our fair share of federal dollars flowing into, into Wyoming. And so, yeah, I, I think, you know, Wyoming is looking at an aging population because our young people continue to leave. Our, our, our young people make up, I think it was, um, they used to make up, 2600 used to make up 18% um, of the workforce. Now it's 14%. And so they're not sticking around. Yeah, if I could add too, I mean, I, I am very concerned about the loss of benefits from coal miners, both current and retired, um, that we've seen through these bankruptcies and just sometimes company action, if, if particularly if they're non-union mines, they can just without any notice um, cut benefit levels. 
Um, I hope it's okay that I'm sharing this story, but I actually just had a conversation with one of my colleagues um, this week who, um, whose dad used to work for Bighorn Coal Mine um, and just recently through the Lighthouse Resources Bankruptcy, um, her mom, who is you know, the surviving beneficiary, um, no longer has healthcare and probably has lost her pension. Um, and so this is you know, something that again, no notice, um, no way to deal with it, no plan B. Um, and so when we're dealing with, you know, as Dustin said, you know, what used to be very well paying jobs with, with a high level of benefits, um, particularly in my state of Wyoming, and now that's no longer a guarantee. Um, as you, you know, see these bankruptcies and these companies just kind of tumble into economic collapse. So it's, it's something that, you know, we're very concerned about. Um, it's not just your paycheck, but it's your overall quality of life and, and how you're able to um, survive into the long term. I would just add that um, Medicaid expansion is not a cure-all. A lot of these areas have seen a winnowing of healthcare infrastructure generally in terms of clinics and hospitals. Um, and we've seen a wave of new black lung cases over the last several years, just because anecdotally, um, what I've heard is that minors don't want to get checked out necessarily while they're employed. So once they get laid off or the company goes bankrupt, they'll they'll seek to have those issues rectified. But finding specialists is very complicated. So it's, it's, um, it's not an easy issue. It's also very challenging. Yeah, I think this is what, you know, one of the things that just shows how complicated this issue is to, to solve. I mean, at the end of the day, you're talking about economic development and diversification. And as Dustin was saying, you know, you have um, the direct co-workers who are losing their jobs. Then you have people in the community that are indirectly losing their jobs, right? Um, for every, you know, power plant worker that loses a job, you typically see two, three, sometimes in some places, four more workers in the community lose their jobs. And then you have the loss of the, the tax revenue, right? So it's, it's just, it's, it's about economic development and diversification. And, uh, you know, what, what is so hard about addressing that problem in these rural communities, because when you're talking about the problem of transitioning cold communities, you are talking about rural communities. And it makes sense because these are places where when something goes away, it's often the only game in town. So it has an outsized impact, right? But, you know, it really means that you have to look at the, the basics. You have to look at the, the health care, the, the, the quality of health care, the quality of education. You know, um, you have to look at a range of social um, infrastructure. You know, we talk a lot at the Just Transition Fund about broadband because broadband is almost like a, um, a gateway drug, if you will, to do all these other things that, that we want to see addressed. You know, you, you can't do economic development if people aren't healthy. You can't do economic development if there's not enough education. You certainly can't do economic development, address inequities, or even tackle climate change if you don't have broadband access. So it's really the basic fundamental, these core infrastructure needs that, that we're talking about here. Great. So there's another question I think that we can kind of steer the conversation around. And Allison Flynn asks, uh, can we address the fate of mining land and restoration? And I know we talked about reclamation as a, as a potential sort of economic boost. So who wants to, who wants to jump in on that? Yeah, I can start. Um, it's, it's something our organization works a lot on and a lot with um, other organizations in Appalachia. Uh, so as we've seen the coal industry again kind of go into decline, a lot of these bankruptcies, um, there have been mines that have been left abandoned. Um, mining companies that come in um, through what we call a, a cycle of vulture capitalism. So they're the bottom feeders really of, of the coal industry and they're buying assets that um, don't have a lot of production and economic life left in them. So um, it, it's something that we're really concerned about and work actively with. Um, I, you know, there's an opportunity, of course, with the new administration. Uh, we do need a partner regulator in the Office of Surface Mining Reclamation and Enforcement. Um, they need to be stronger on this issue, and they need to work more with state regulators to, to make sure mines are reclaimed and reclaimed fast, um, because that is actually the guarantee of the law as it exists right now, is for mines to be reclaimed as um, their mind out um, and to have final reclamation um, better than it was before the mining even started. Um, so that's the goal of the law. Um, and again, we need some regulators that will help us out to make sure that that happens. Yeah, I'm, we're really excited about the, the reclamation economy, you know, going to some of the points that both Dustin, um, that I think Dustin made um, earlier is you know, there's, there's all kinds of solutions out there, you know, like let's, let's trade, you know, let's train coal miners to code and let's do this and that. And, 
it's tough, particularly for an aging workforce, right? You know, if you're 55 or 60 and you've been doing one thing for your whole life, you know, talking about learning the skills to do something new, like that's a real challenge, you know? Um, I think the interesting thing for us and, and our grantees like, like Shannon and uh, Powder River Basin and others at Northern Plains and other communities have, you know, thought long and hard about the reclamation economy. And to me, that's really exciting because when you start talking about cleaning up and reclaiming both abandoned coal mines and power plants, you have got, um, you, you've got jo immediate job opportunities for workers that often have those skill sets anyway, right? So in a way, it's kind of a nice uh, bridge, if you will, to those some of those longer economic development and diversification strategies that, you know, honestly take time to get there. It's a looming issue here in Appalachia, um, not just the pre-1977 abandoned mines, but potentially another round that could be coming. We're starting to kind of see the tip of the spear with the blank, um, sorry, the black jewel bankruptcy, um, where where it's still in um, the, the bankruptcy plan has been approved, but um, the they're chopping around a number of um, mining permits that aren't productive, that haven't been reclaimed. And uh, there's widespread speculation that ultimately be abandoned. Um, that could, you know, that could have detrimental effects on Kentucky's bond pool, but even in cases where there are third party bonds set aside, there's a lot of discussion about whether that money is sufficient or not. And even, even um, re reclaim my lands that have been well done, um, you know, still have poor soils, uh, you know, if it's a, if it's a service mine. So it is a, is a, it is a looming issue. Um, beyond just these individual permits and bond numbers, um, you know, the effects on the communities could be could be widespread. But we'll see where it goes. Yeah, and I'll just add quickly that you know in Wyoming uh, you know, we have a lot of disturbed surface to reclaim, and the the, the kind of reclaim as you go um, pace uh, could be better. And I think, you know, it's an open question. Nobody's ever reclaimed a surface coal mine that sprawls 10 square miles, you know? What does that entail? Um, and, you know, are there pieces of that infrastructure that local communities might want to save or repurpose? Um, you know, Wyoming has, uh, there's a sprawling electrical grid that serves all these coal mines. Uh, and the grid is paid for. The, the local co-op says it doesn't plan on ripping it out as coal mines unplug, but they're also not actively kind of, um, you know, uh, thinking about things to plug in too. So these discussions need to happen very soon. And there's a, there's a couple of follow-up questions that I, I think will kind of, uh, so, so Allison follows up, uh, how do we change the attitudes and have political will to use spent mine lands as economic centers? Related question to that comes from uh, Nadia. And Nadia, I'm, I'm not familiar with how to say your last name, so I'm not going to get it wrong. Um, do people in these communities believe that coal can still come back or hoping that they can use uh, clean coal for production of other products? Is there thinking that this is more than the boom bust coal cycle? And what those questions to me are are related because another thing we've sort of talked about is what are the the bigger sort of political and systemic barriers um, to um, making these to, to to thinking more broadly and thinking more uh, creatively about addressing these problems. I know uh, Dustin, that's something you've encountered in particular in Wyoming. Do you want to kick that one off, and we'll we'll expand from there. Yeah, you know, I, I think here in Wyoming, you know, sometimes the biggest challenge to this is is ourselves and our, our politics. Um, I, I think, you know, right now, kind of there, there's a political attitude to cope rather than talk about transition as something that is necessary. And it's, it, it's happening now. Like, we are going to transition. Um, the question is, are we going to um, determine, help determine our own fate? Um, yeah, while there's a lot of uh, transition efforts uh, and kind of offices being set up in, in, in different states, there's nothing comparable like that 
happening in Wyoming, you know, coming from the governor's office or the legislature or, you know, any government agency, but there are a, a lot of kind of disparate efforts that, that, that understand that this needs to happen. Um, and I'm, there, there's a network of, you know, probably half a dozen uh, grassroots organizations that are uh, kind of quietly leading the way on, on this. Um, but yeah, you know, the reaction in, in Wyoming, our, our legislature has, you know, just passed a law uh, setting aside $1.2 million to sue other states for not using our coal. Um, you know, the governor's been using taxpayer dollars to fund a private group that goes into other states, pretends to be grassroots there uh, to argue against coal plant closures, you know? And uh, so, so that, very, that very much stands in the way. Um, it, it, and it, it's a disconnect, uh, you know, these legislative actions uh, seem to be a real disconnect from, you know, people in these communities who, who, who see the writing on the wall. Like they know that these jobs are going away, um, but they still vote the way they vote. Uh, yeah, it's, um, I, it, I think people also tend to like to assign single issues or even a, a suite of issues as drivers in people's vote, but they're very much tangled up in that cultural and questions of culture and questions of identity. Um, and Appalachia, you know, mo most of Appalachia tends to be very Republican voting. We just had a special election um, in the Southwestern Virginia coal fields um, last month and the Democrats dumped in a lot of money um, to trying to make this race competitive and the Republicans still won with 76% of the vote, which is not that unusual. That's pretty, pretty normal. Um, but even, even amid that though, you, I mean, so I would look at West Virginia and their state legislature this past session they um, they elected a super majority Republican or a super a Republican super majority. I'm sorry, in both chambers of the West Virginia State House, um, and yet they did not go um, full throated. I mean, they, so the coal industry is vocal, and and you have a lot of coal champions, but even sell they held back a lot and and gutted. And, and restrain themselves on a lot of the laws that were passed. So I think that reflects the recognition of that the coal industry can never be what it once was. But at the same time, I think they also don't wanna go full in the other direction. So they're kind of stuck in between, even, even where Republicans and, and coal boosters control the mechanisms of state government, they're constrained from going too far and you know, against the um, economic realities of the market. Yeah, I mean, I would just add to this too that until that plan B is really, you know, prevalent and it's something that people can kind of grab onto and understand what it is, you're always going to try and save plan A, right? I mean, so that's sort of where we are in our communities is we, we know that we get money from coal. We know that we get jobs from coal. We don't know what else we can get money and jobs from yet. Um, so it really is, as you know, as Heidi said, it's that creative kind of out of the box thinking that's going to be about, you know, how do we do something else and really trying to commit to that something else um, and, and giving it the resources and attention um, that we need to, to make that actually happen. Um, versus, you know, as Dustin said, and I would add unsuccessfully going into other states to try and, and stop coal plant closure because we can't stop the market. We can't stop you know, where things are. Um, it's just not a reality that we can do here in Wyoming. So um, again, we've got to start thinking about that plan B and we've got to start thinking about it today, not tomorrow. Yeah, just to add on what Shannon said about the unsuccess, um, you know, Virginia has, has um, democratic control of government, but it's also home to one of the more recent coal plants in the country, the Dominion, um, uh, hybrid plant and uh, near outside St. Paul, Virginia. I think it was opened in 2006 or thereabouts. And yet it's going to, you know, under state law, it's supposed to be phased out by 2050 or 2045 um, within the near future, which was unthinkable just a few years ago. Yeah, and, and you know, that, 
that plant is is losing money. It's losing money, a lot of money for that for that local community down in Southwest Virginia. You know, and you know, it's just it's just interesting talking about just how things are changing. Um, you know, um, even Virginia. We're, we're start, I do feel like we're starting to see pro progress, right? There are nuggets of good things. I mean, even West Virginia this past, some, this past session, they passed a great bill to legalize power purchase agreements, right? That's really gonna help expand the solar energy industry. I mean, we always talk about like where we're losing coal jobs and they're not the place where we're creating new clean renewable energy laws, but you know, change at the state level is essential. So that's a step in the right direction. The Virginia State General Assembly took some good action on, on, on repealing some, uh, some taxes regarding coal. So again, it's, it's progress. I think it's, um, we're in a different place than we were a few years ago. Um, but I think with COVID just accelerating closures and making things so much worse, I think just from here on out, the pace of change is just going to keep getting faster and it's going to be hard and harder for policymakers to, you know, to deny it. Great. Um, Shannon, you mentioned uh, earlier that not knowing what plan B is, right? Like not knowing where the communities go next. And of course, everybody, there's a lot of ideas around where where we go next. And so we have some questions from the audience around this. Uh, Samuel asks about um, uh, the rise of remote work as a potential draw for new residents. Is this viewed as a boon for the economy and a way to revitalize small towns or as a cultural threat given the types of people who may be moving in to work, work remotely? Um, Jeffrey is asking about um, tourism, how viable or realistic are the prospects for tourism-based economy in these communities. Wade asks a similar question, citing uh, Bend, Oregon as an example. And so I'll just kind of throw this out uh, to, to everybody. A um, uh, lot, lot of big ideas. What's, what's working? What's uh, maybe, maybe this are, are not as, as simple as they sound. Uh, who wants to, to take this on? Yeah, I'd love to actually talk about the remote work um, opportunities because that's really, there's some really exciting work coming out of Southern West Virginia by an organization called Generation West Virginia that we've been working with for a number of years. And they've got a couple of programs that they are doing a number of different things. They are working to try to retain the state's young talent, um, you know, connecting them with jobs with, with both in-state and they're thinking about out-of-state employers, right? So this is not, offering remote work is not necessarily a strategy to bring other people in. It's about thinking about, as Shannon alluded to earlier, the, the human resources and the assets that we have already in these communities, right? Um, the local colleges, the community colleges, um, Wise County, Virginia, there's a, a, there's a portion of the University of Virginia there that they're doing great work on, on, on new tech ideas, right? So, I mean, I think we just don't often think about this with respect to, um, to rural communities. So there's a real opportunity to to try to offer jobs for people in these communities with companies that are not based there that would provide a real economic boost um, to those local economies. Yeah, I would say on tourism in particular, obviously Wyoming has tremendous assets for tourism. Um, Gillette incidentally had a slogan, fill the power of the tower. Uh, that was all about Devil's Tower and uh, you know, recreation and tourism around uh, our first national monument, uh, which is very close to Gillette. Um, Gillette is also very close to mountains and is on kind of the route to Yellowstone and, and a few other things too. So um, you know, we have a three-legged stool of economy here in Wyoming, uh, tourism being the third leg and the smallest leg, but um, it, it definitely has some opportunity that could be developed. Um, and in terms of the remote workforce, I'd be interested to, to hear what Dustin has to say on this too, but the challenge in Wyoming is that uh, unless we diversify our tax base, uh, we have a, a challenge when people move to the state. So we can increase the population, but not increase our revenue. Um, and, and that is a real challenge for us. Um, so everybody who kind of moves here actually ends up being more of a drain um, on our resources, including education um, and hospitals than creating benefits um, until we diversify that tax base. Right, and, 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 and that's, that's a choice, right? That, and a, pretty soon it's not going to be a choice that we're going to have to restructure our tax and revenue system uh, <clears throat> after this mineral wealth goes away. Um, they're just gonna have to broaden the tax base. And so, you know, I don't think folks in Wyoming are saying, hey, you know, we can't diversify. Um, yes, we, we must diversify and fix our tax structure so that it's not 
kind of a net loss to us. Um, you know, the remote work um, uh, idea is, is really interesting for Wyoming. It, if you're coming from out of state to work remotely from Wyoming, you're probably going to want to land somewhere in the western part of the state. Um, but maybe, I don't know, maybe, maybe eastern Wyoming might appeal to you. It appeals to me. Uh, but there's also, you know, uh, not everybody uh, can really hack a couple of Wyoming winters, too. So you know, that's the other point that, you know, the talent and labor that lives here and that commute an hour and a half to a coal mine uh, to work a 12 hour shift, commute back in, in a snowstorm. I mean, these are hardy people who are dedicated to living here. Um, you, you know, it's, it, it, they're really kind of irreplaceable. Uh, so, but what I'm really interested, you know, a, a lot of our service, uh, uh, our mining service and oil and gas service, uh, the, there's kind of a, a big belt of this across the state of Wyoming. And a lot of them have, have learned how to um, attract more international clientele. And, and that's something I'm going to be really interested to follow. Yeah, certainly here in Appalachia, people are talking about folks moving from the pandemic, but it's all anecdotal. I haven't seen hard numbers to really back up the, the anecdotes yet. Um, regarding tourism, it's pretty much a common denominator in every community's transition plan, simply because the region's so beautiful. There's a lot of outdoor assets. Um, that said, I do draw a distinction between those communities that are trying to go all in on tourism and those that see it as one ingredient. I think the community a lot of people look to as the, um, the icon, the, the example, the role model for it, this is Sevier County, Tennessee, which is outside the Smokies. That's where Gatlinburg and Pigeon Forge and Dollywood is, if you hear that. But if you look at that community, they, they do pretty well in, in top line economic figures, but a lot of those jobs are seasonal. Um, they're part time, they don't carry strong benefits. And when you compare them with the textile mill economy that was there a generation before, it just don't replace on job per job level. Um, now that said, there are communities that have done well um, using tourism. I would point to Roanoke, Virginia, which is, um, not a coal producing community, but it's it's in the it's in the railroad ring that I talked about. Um, it was the epicenter for the Norfolk and Western Railroad and then Norfolk Southern. And that company has um, gradually pulled out of Roanoke, I think nearly entirely um, to Norfolk, Virginia and down to Atlanta. Um, but Virginia really, I mean, Roanoke really leaned in on its outdoor resources as a marketing um, as a marketing point. And that's done well in not only drawing outdoor um, outfitters, and recreation companies, but it's also drawn some like advanced manufacturing and other sectors because companies locate there, um, you know, partly because there are some other things. It's on the railroad, it's on Interstate 81, it's in a pretty easy way to reach the East Coast um, merchant base. But on top of that, um, people want to be where their employees want to be. And so these companies are located and that quality of life, outdoor recreation is a factor because their, their employees want to go up to the Appalachian Trail and ride on the Blue Ridge Parkway and all these different things. So, you know, I think it's going to be different for every community and how it fits in. This is great. And, you know, there's a lot of really good questions that are, that are coming in. I want to acknowledge and, and, uh, appreciate everyone for for your thoughtful questions we won't be able to get to all of them i we're we're running a, a low on time and I, I i did promise that we'd we'd introduce a little bit of optimism <laughs> to the conversation and so uh since uh summer of 2020 when we published this series there was a, a not so uh insignificant election that took place and I want to give uh, Heidi a, a minute or two to kind of tell us about what's happening now. We have an entirely new administration that's taking a whole new approach. Uh, what's going on at the federal level and then uh, how it might trickle down to these states and regionals, regions. Yeah, thanks, Ken. It's so exciting. It's like a completely different um, sea change. I was just talking with somebody earlier today about how, um, you know, we, we see that communities have the best outcomes when they're available, when they're ready, when they have the resources to start planning early. And the last four years with the, with the Trump administration, it's been really tough. There's just been a lack of action, right? A lack of response to help these communities deal with these changes. And 
that's changing. So um, we see the um, on, on, at the end of January, President Biden put forward uh, his climate executive order. And in that executive order, he created a new interagency working group on, on uh, coal and power plant um, economic revitalization. He's also looking at, at I think, uh, transitioning oil um, and gas communities to, um, as well, but they're really going to start on coal. And that report by the IWG is coming out um, soon. I think it will be actually out this week. And the administration just has taken these issues really seriously and started a number of listening sessions with the people that are most affected by the problem. And so that really bodes well. Um, you know, the um, administration also released their idea around the American Jobs Plan and the infrastructure package. And, you know, we'll see who, where that goes, but there's a lot of things in that plan to help coal communities. Along the lines of things that we've been talking about today, you know, retraining, investments in critical infrastructure, and a new rural partnership program right, that is really going to boost economic um, development in these in these countries or in these um, communities. So I think it's really positive. You know, it's it's a tough problem. It has a lot of components, but I think if you can hang in there and, you know, get your arms around the complexity and make sure that you listen to all the different stakeholders that are affected, and there are a lot, um, I think we're going to make progress. And so um, I think our community is, is really excited about the changes we're seeing at the federal level. Yeah, we, we talked about that reclamation economy and, and $10 billion for coal mine cleanup will go a long way in both Appalachia and Wyoming. So um, that's really encouraging. Um, there was a bunch of questions also um, in the Q&A about Reclaim, um, the Reclaim Act and AML reauthorization. Um, those are both uh, pieces of federal legislation that our organization supports, as well as um, numerous organizations in Appalachia. Um, they're important pieces to address the legacy impacts of coal mining, um, and particularly um, abandoned mines that have been there for decades and have been polluting water and um, scarring landscapes. So um, those are also kind of important pieces of, of the hope, um, that probably that we'll go through within the next few months um, to get some influxes of money into our communities and, and to help with that reclamation economy. Great. Okay, Heidi, anything to add, Mason? See you popping on. Yeah, actually, just maybe. Oh, sorry, Mason. Oh, I was just going to say, I, I, there is also a question in the in the chat that I wanted to respond to, where somebody asked, are, are there enough commonalities between at least um, Appalachia and and Wyoming, where they can where the people can bond together to really advocate for what's needed at the federal level? And I was just going to encourage people to check out the the National Economic Transition um, org, our National Economic Transition Platform, NAT platform. We pulled together local leaders from tribal communities out west, Illinois Basin, Appalachia, um, to do exactly that, to craft and identify uh, what is needed at the federal level for an ambitious new federal coal community transition program. And the the seven pillars that we that we came up with, of which there, you know, we need we need an we need investments in each of those span from economic development, workforce development, infrastructure, reclamation, um, you know, uh, uh, addressing bankruptcies, all of the issues that we talked about today. So it was exciting, again, focusing on the commonalities, you know, their coal communities are already banding together to, to not only, um, you know, work together to, to advocate for what's needed at the federal level, but for also to make sure that they're lifting up the local solutions that have already proven to work in these communities and that are, are really you know, built from the ground up and um, showing promise. I've also seen questions and, and we wrote a little bit about this in the series um, about carbon capture and, and manufacturing from, from other coal. I mean, look, coal uh, for, for discussion of its um, disruption and demise, it's not gonna go away here in Appalachia, the metallurgical coal industry, which makes, um, you know, which makes the product use in steel making is, is going to be around for the foreseeable future. It's going to, it's, it's tied to global market forces and will continue to cycle based on that. Um, that said, I think, I think um, we've also seen some areas that are sort of mined out. And, and I think that's the, the tie in growth in black lung rates is, is, is related to that. Um, but at the same time, um, certainly lawmakers, even here in um, Virginia, which has a, you know, it's the, the regional lawmakers are um, passing initiatives for energy research and development. They're looking at carbon capture. They're looking at manufacturing based out of coal. Um, and, and, and with the, 
I think especially with the forthcoming announcement um, about emissions cuts by, by half, uh, I think that's there's going to be more intensity around those programs. What results they produce, I don't know. That's We'll see where that goes. Um, but I think we're going to be hearing more about those types of things. Excellent. Yeah, clearly we need to do this for two hours next time. But so I, I want to uh, begin sort of wrapping this up here. Our panelists will have a, a last kind of parting shot here. Uh, in just a minute, but I have to give you the timeshare pitch before we do that. Um, so a reminder that this event is being recorded. You will receive an email with the recording after the fact. Uh, the Energy News Network and Wildfile are both nonprofit newsrooms. We do the kinds of journalism that you, you don't uh, often see. Uh, we're able to really dig deep on these really complex issues. And so if you value that kind of reporting, I would encourage you to uh, check out uh, energynews.us and wildfile.com wildfile or .org. Dustin.com uh, and uh, sign up for our newsletters, uh, send a donation if you feel like it. And you can also find our uh, reporting series on either of those websites. You'll get a link in your email as well. Uh, again, this is also available in book form. We don't really make any money on this book. All right. So uh, it's, it, you know, this is not any sort of self-interest. We, we break even on the book. So um, feel free to buy it in that format if you like. And then now I will go back to our panelists. Let's go in reverse order from the introductions, reverse alphabetical order. So uh, we got four minutes left so let's go for about 45 seconds a piece so dustin go go for it what's one thing so i should set up the question right this is <laughs> this is a really really complicated difficult intractable problem um and if there is one single thing that you hope our audience takes away from this conversation today what would that be uh that would be that the entire united states has a stake in these coal communities um these coal communities, uh, not only have they powered the United States um, economy for decades, uh, but, they, but they also help support a broader region. They help support uh, towns that are further away that, so that they can uh, you know, uh, survive on tourism, for example. And, it, it, and so th there's not a, a community that's, that's not going to be affected. By the, by this permanent uh, uh, declining coal, and, and so uh, these these communities are assets, um, and, and they're human assets. So I, I guess that's the one thing I want people to take away. Great, Heidi. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. Heidi, you're um, up. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, no, thanks. Thanks, Ken. Um, yeah, here, here, Dustin. I mean, we, we get asked all the questions all, all the time, the question, why should we care? And, you know, I think people don't think about exactly that, right? How not only these these coal communities um, helped power our country, but they helped fuel both Appalachia and the tribal communities, Navajo and Hopi, and, and with the build out of the Colorado Plateau, right? They helped electrify Phoenix, LA, right? I mean, they enabled the, in, the economic prosperity that we all enjoy today. So I think we need to think about that. But um, what I would say, um, you know, so many things to, to consider, but um, I'm optimistic. I, I think we're, we're heading in the right direction. I, I think we, we really need to start with the basics, right? I just keep kind of bringing it back to, to broadband as you know, the, just being such a fundamental um, barrier for, for a lot of these communities and some of the other social infrastructure that we're, that we're talking about. I think that's essential. And the other thing I think that, um, that, that gives me hope too is the fact that there are a number of existing programs and a number of actions that the federal government can take immediately. Right, and I think that's you know on us um, to really advocate for. So um, those are just a few of my top level takeaways. Okay, Shale. Well, I just am realizing we're all A's and B's in the alphabet, so that's <laughs> that's something. Um, uh, I you know I think that the thing that I would want people to take away from this conversation is a sense of urgency. Um, and really not only for our economies and the workers in our states, um, but also the climate crisis and the reasons why we are having this transition. Um, so it, it's really, I think, again, it's not a conversation we should have tomorrow, it's one we need to have today. Um, and I'm, I'm really glad that there's um, a coalition of groups and, and others, um, stakeholders, government officials, agencies that are willing to have this conversation with us. So thanks. I repeat it so much, it's, it becomes a trope in my in my work but things are always more complicated than they look on the surface 
just in Appalachia alone, you have nine different states that produce coal. That's nine different, you know, cultures. That's nine different oversight bodies. Um, that's, you know, different kinds of coal in different places. And, and um, that's, that complicates, um, especially when it gets into the culture, it becomes a bigger discussion than just coal. So that it, it there's always complicating factors in these discussions, but at the end of the day, these places do matter. Um, even if you, you know, think they're voting in their own interests or whatever, whatever phrases people like to toss out. I mean, these matter from a sheer human rights perspective, um, not to mention the debt owed for, you know, powering America into a superpower in the 20th century. Great. Thank you. We are out of time. Thank you to our panelists. I also want to acknowledge Joe Olson, who is our communications uh, guru here at Fresh Energy for driving the bus and keeping us all in line uh, throughout this event. And most of all, thank you to everyone who's joined us today. You will be hearing back from us very soon. Thank you for tuning in to the audio recording of our Earth Day webinar. You can stay up to date on Fresh Energy's work at fresh-energy.org or follow us on social media. You can also subscribe to Energy News Network's original reporting and Energy News Aggregation Listserv. Their reporting and listservs are conveniently broken up by region, uh, featuring the Midwest, Southeast, Northeast, and Western areas of the United States. Visit energynews.us to sign up. And thank you everyone listening for subscribing to our podcast. You can support Fresh Energy's work by making a donation today. Visit our website at fresh-energy.org and click donate in the upper right corner. Thank you for listening.